Hi everyone, this is a video for those who aren't familiar with the subtleties and hidden themes of Stanley Kubrick's work. Lots of filmmakers have put hidden themes and messages in their movies and have even admitted to it. But in the past 10 years an explosion of interpretations of Kubrick's films have emerged in which it's claimed that Kubrick faked the moon landings, tried to expose the Illuminati and even that he was a 33rd degree mason who put out propaganda films on behalf of the New World Order. Understandably, those theories are likely to make most people switch off to any proposed deeper interpretations of Kubrick's work. For decades, Kubrick's films such as Lolita 2001, Clockwork Orange, Doctor Strangelove and Eyes Wide Shut have generated huge discussions among film critics and scholars and audiences as to what it was that Kubrick was actually trying to communicate, with many books having been published on the subjects. So the idea that the online film fan interpretations of The Shining or any other Kubrick film are all just conspiracy theories and that there are no deeper meanings in the films is nonsense, even though some of the theories are extremely implausible. Regarding Kubrick's earlier film Dr. Strangelove, two letters from Kubrick's personal archives which have since been published after his death reveal that a university professor in America had written to Kubrick about Dr. Strangelove pointing out the film's subliminal sexual themes and Kubrick responded to him, confirming that the themes were actually there and congratulating the professor for having noticed them when the critics had missed it. Here I'm going to present you with a selection of details and factoids which collectively reveal that most of Kubrick's films are not what they appear to be on the surface, and in some cases contain hidden meanings that are in direct opposition to their surface plot appearances. Let's start with 2001 A Space Odyssey. When the executives supposedly have a briefing meeting on the moon, they are doing so in full gravity. This could have been avoided by not having the characters move around on the set. Nevertheless, the photographer virtually runs. An important clue here is that the characters are also surrounded by blank cinema screens, note the black curtains. While travelling to the moon, the shots are packed with severe lighting errors and discontinuity, and the moon even changes colour between shots, much like the landscapes at the end of the film. In one scene, astronauts Bowman and Poole watch space race propaganda while eating synthetic mushy food, while in another scene, executives eat synthetic food as they talk about finding an alien artifact on the moon. But in the film's ending, Dave Bowman finally eats real food. The murderous computer's name is Hal, each letter being one letter ahead of the letters IBM in the alphabet. When Hal dies, he sings Daisy Bell, the same song sung by IBM's first synthetic speech computer. The letters IBM also shine on Bowman's face as he repeatedly says, Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hal appears to kill the hibernating crew, but visible in the HD release of the film, there's a set of emergency revival procedures on the console, which means that Dave Bowman might have actually revived them. There are also no verbal descriptions of alien life throughout the whole movie. The only apparently alien thing that we encounter is the monolith, but turn it on its side and it's the screen on which the film is being watched. Don't believe me? Watch this video. Next up, Full Metal Jack, it's probably Kubrick's least studied and least appreciated film. Lead character Joker's peace badge disappears behind his collar precisely at the moment that he executes the injured sniper. There are assorted strange statements written in the Vietnamese street signs. This one translates as All United States. And this weird one translates as To continuously serve the devil, your excellency. But if you're going to try and translate them yourself, don't forget the diacritic markings above and below the letters. Mickey Mouse is used again and again to imply something stupid and illogical. What is this Mickey Mouse shit? What in the name of Jesus H. Christ are you animals doing in my head? Mickey Mouse figures are placed behind Joker in the propaganda newsroom scenes with one of them waving to us. And the soldiers sing a Mickey Mouse song at the end of the movie implying that all of their marching sons are generally stupid. The news editor talks of buying toothpaste for the Vietnamese, a false sign of sincerity, and we get toothpaste ad billboards later. When the Lust Hog Squad are hiring a hooker for a gangbang, they are sat in rows of seats dragged out of a cinema behind them, and Animal Mother takes the prostitute into the cinema as the scene ends. On that cinema, a John Wayne movie is being shown called Red River, and it has a picture of him attacking a Native American. John Wayne is referenced several times throughout the movie, and the Vietnamese are likened to Native Americans. I'll be General Custer. We'll be the Indians. Hey, we'll let the Gooks play the Indians. I, uh, I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture, and 
kill them. There are also several indications that the Lust Hog squad in the cryptic second half of the film actually symbolise the recruits from the first half of the movie whose identities have been radically altered. A major clue is that the squad number used for the recruits in the film is the exact same one used for the Lust Hogs in the script. Let's move on to The Shining. Keeping those Full Metal Jacket Red River Native American movie details in mind, The Shining also features a Red River, possibly symbolising the genocide of Native Americans. There wasn't a river of blood in Stephen King's novel, and only in the film is the hotel built on an Indian burial ground. Native American chanting is heard on the opening credits, there are Native American designs and framed pictures of Native Americans and Native artwork all over the hotel, and there's the Indian chief on the baking tin of course. The set layouts which were constructed in a studio are physically impossible to disorientate the viewer. This has been publicly confirmed by the executive producer as being intentional. Lights switch themselves on and off between shots. Furniture changes positions and moves from one room to another between shots and between scenes. In the end photo, Jack is surrounded by political and economic figures who were prominent in the early days of the creation of the Federal Reserve Banking System in America, which eventually got the US entirely off the gold standard. Hence there's a gold room in the film that wasn't in the novel. See my video Kubrick's Gold Story for more about that. In the psychiatrist scene, Wendy is parodied by a goofy toy that has the same coloured clothes on as her. The toy is also on puppet strings, just like Wendy who tries to defend her husband's domestic violence tendencies. Some folks have said that the eyes of the bear on Danny's pillow are deliberately designed to look like the floor dials of the elevator scene, and it's most likely true. Here's the original bear pillow from an old catalogue. The one we see in the film has had its eyes trimmed to look like the elevator. Bear symbols are used elsewhere in the film in association to sexual exploitation. And of course Jack reads a Playgirl magazine in the lobby. Eyes Wide Shut In the Ziegler party this guy offers to show Alice a gallery of Renaissance bronzes, which are a type of statue. Later the Somerton Mansion orgy is full of them. Blue light is used in some scenes to make characters look like mannequins or to give their faces the appearance of pale ballroom masks like the ones we see in the orgy. The guy who approaches the girl on the balcony is wearing a plague doctor's mask, which tallies with the scene in which Bill discovers a prostitute he has met has AIDS. A modern plague of sorts. The red-cloaked guy in the orgy spins an incense ball and double taps his staff on the floor repeatedly, and later Ziegler spins a cue ball repeatedly in his hand and double taps it on the red pool table. That was just... Uh... Listen... <coughs> Bill... He even does it with the chalk too. The identities of the orgy participants are subtly revealed in the paintings that they are surrounded by. Note that there are no mirrors in any of these rooms. Hence the book title, Shadow on the Mirror, appears in another scene in a set with many masks on the walls. The whole orgy scene was also filmed in Mentmore Towers, which was formerly owned by the Rothschild family. A Clockwork Orange, we're led to believe that this film is set in the future, but aside from the bizarre, overly sexual artworks featured in many scenes, there's very little in the film to suggest that it's set anywhere in the future. In one of the fictional newspaper props that featured the story of Alex's brainwashing ordeal, the date given is 1972. Another has the date 1970. The film itself was released in 1971. A significant change between the novel and film is that in the novel Alex is conditioned against all music, but in the film, Alex only develops an aversion to the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And in the novel, it was a different Beethoven piece that was played in the brainwashing scenes, his fifth symphony. As if to draw attention to the musical change, the opening bars of Beethoven's fifth are heard as the doorbell to the writer's house. By interesting coincidence, an altered version of the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was adopted as the national anthem of the European Union in the year after A Clockwork Orange was released. And in the movie, an altered version is heard in the brainwashing scene and at the very start of the film. Then I noticed, in all my pain and sickness, what music it was that, like, cracked and boomed. It was Ludwig van. Ninth Symphony, fourth movement. And the same musical piece was once famously played as a celebration of Hitler's birthday. Note that the film of Clockwork Orange has lots of Nazi references too. Most of these weren't in the novel.
And the last film we're going to explore here, AI Artificial Intelligence. Now you may think, hold on, Spielberg directed AI. Yes he did, but only after Kubrick spent two decades developing the story with a variety of famous sci-fi writer collaborators and concept artists. In the finished film, which is hugely underrated, the so-called happy ending isn't a happy one at all, because David has become as bad as his own makers. He abandons his loyal friend Teddy, just as he was abandoned. There are also multiple suggestions that David actually dies in the Amphibicopter, but before doing so he finally achieves that which the AI engineers had struggled to accomplish. He goes asleep and dreams a happy ending for himself, which would mean that the big Ice Age scenes and the Super Mecha aren't real. They're just in his imagination. In other scenes, there are indicators that people are programmed like robots too. Gigolo Joe tells this woman all the pleasant lies that she wants to hear as he touches the back of her neck, just as David's neck was touched in the same way when he was programmed to fall in love with Monica. Remember I said about the monolith in 2001 representing a cinema screen or TV screen? Well, in this scene from AI, we get a 2001 styled intro, a professor who pops out of the screen and the characters are surrounded by tiny monoliths all tilted on their sides. Oh, and before I finish, in the Kubrick Archives book, it's mentioned by one of Kubrick's close collaborators that Stanley believed David Kahn's book The Code Breakers was one of the most important books ever written. And what's the book all about? The History of Message Encoding and Decoding. Okay, I'll stop there. If you want to know more, then subscribe and visit and bookmark my site, collativelearning.com, I've produced very detailed studies of all the Kubrick films featured in this video. I've also got lots of videos and articles about other movies and film related topics and a huge backlog of digital downloads. If you're already familiar with my work and want to spread the word to people who presently lack the patience for detailed study, then be sure to pass on the link to this video to anyone who you think might enjoy it. Until next time, take it easy.